Hi, good morning tea timers. Um, today I'm drinking number 10, which is green and black tea with a little bit of cream. It's nice. Oh, oh, I just noticed. Um, so when I'm here at this place, you notice that sometimes I'm doing this. That's because this is a rocking chair. You might not be able to tell, but I all of a sudden realized you guys might just think I'm just sitting here going rock a rock on my own, but that's because this is a rocking chair. You're supposed to rock. I, I, I don't usually sit in rocking chairs as, as rock in chairs, regular chairs. I mean, I might, but I'm not aware of it. But anyway, this is a rocking chair. So don't worry for me if you see me doing this all the time. <laughs> okay, let's see. What do we have in our little book? Let's see, let's see. Oh, you know what? Um, there's been, several people have asked me about this and I kind of have put it off because um, because I have mixed feelings about it, but um, it's there's too many times. Uh, let's see, so I, I will answer it. Lee Anderson said, hi Meg, would you comment on the movie The Girl on a Swing? I saw it when it came out in the theaters. Karen is a mystery, what's your take on her? Also, a deluxe DVD would be awesome. So we could see the director's cut best. And then he wrote that twice. <laughs> I wrote it down and then he, he wrote it and I thought, I think I, and I went back earlier in the thing and he had written the same thing. He's been very patient. And then um, Imran Khan, sorry, I can't pronounce it, um, said, I'd like to know, oh no, that, that person said, I'd like to know too. I heard there was a longer director's cut version of the film that was never released. And uh, Salvio Bouquet said, would you talk about your film, Girl on a Swing? What was it like to be in that film? Okay, so Girl on a Swing. So that came about because, um, that came about because I had read the book and uh, the book by Richard Adams who wrote Watership Down. And it was, uh, it, there was just something about it that just called me. And uh, she, it was, a, the, what the story's about, for those of you who don't know, it's uh, paganism versus Christianity. And it's just sort of like the, the two. So uh, the, the man that Karen falls in love with is, uh, is English. And then she was German. And she is a, a kind of the embodiment of a modern day Aphrodite. So. It was all very, very literary, but the truth of the matter is I had no clothes on. <laughs> it was the first time and the only time that I've ever done, like, you know, had all my clothes off and kids, you know, plug your ears. But it's because how can you play Aphrodite? She's not scared of her body. She's not, you know, all uptight. She's just like, this is who I am. And this is what a woman is. And she's proud of her body and she's proud of her own sensuality. And, um, and there's a mystery woven in there as well. And so um, I just fell in love with her and she was so complex and she was so different from me. At that time, I was still wearing, I was wearing flannel nightgowns up to here. And I, I wasn't, <laughs> I, I didn't take my clothes off for nothing, but, um, but you can't play Aphrodite if you don't take your clothes off. So I did the movie and I did it um, for no money. I did it right after Masquerade for no money. Um, my first class dressing room was not a first class dressing room. It had, there was no budget. Sometimes I was, I remember we were shooting this thing on Bond Street and my quote first class dressing room was the back of a car. <laughs> there was a trunk and I had to hunker down so people going by wouldn't see me as I changed for one scene to the next because they were shooting several scenes. So it was, um, it was a, a interesting experience, but I, believed so passionately in her and I'd gotten so deeply into her skin and um and there were all these little clues that I put in so it was like carefully crafted you know in the book these little things come around so you, until you you find out so I thought when I saw the director's cut when I sat and I saw the director's cut I was so so proud of it it was when I was shooting um Valmont and I got to see the director's cut in a break and it was, or no, before I shot Thelma, but right, right before. And it was so, I was so proud of it. I thought this might be the best work or some of the best work I've ever done because it was three and a half hours, which I know is long for a film, 
but it was so beautiful and there were just these little clues that I did. I put together like a little mosaic that made this this whole person and you understood why she was and, and why she did what she did. And um, and it was I just found her very, very moving. So on Amadeus, I, I not Amadeus, on Valmont, I'd fallen in love with Colin, uh, who was my co-star. And, um, and I was invited to the opening. And you know, when you're like a new relationship and you wanna say, look, s see what I did. You know, I was gonna show him, you, you know, like, look what I did, you know, my badges of honor or whatever. Cause I thought it was such a beautiful film and I was so proud of it. So he went with me. We had a break in the shooting when they were shooting something with um, Annette Benning, and we were able to go down for the big gala opening. And, you know, Richard Adams flew down and the, the king and queen of Den Denmark were there and we sat right next to them. And I was really shy, but I was really pleased. And then the lights went down and the movie came up and I was horrified. I was absolutely horrified because they'd cut out all the little the clues that English wasn't the first language of the producers. And so they had just cut out all the little scenes in between that connected the dots. Um, maybe it wasn't three and a half hours. Maybe it was two and a half hours. Yeah, I think it might've been two and a half. Anyway, they'd cut it all down and all they'd left in is the naked scenes and the crying scenes. So I was just crying and naked. So if a scene was too long, they would just lop it off in the middle. They wouldn't take out a sentence here or a sentence there. They just lopped it off. So there's no reason for the scene. All you'd have is her like, ah, 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 but you wouldn't have the reasons why or his gradual questioning that brought her to that point. And I was so, oh my gosh, I wanted, I thought maybe I shouldn't act anymore because I felt like, um, I felt like I had, I had been or that I had violated Karen un, unwittingly because I didn't have the control over what happened to her or how she was presented or even though I did my my some of my best work ever I didn't have a control over that and I was so sad and I do wish that they put out a director's cut because um it was because because I did such good work in there, but you know, who cares but me? But I did feel really bad. I felt bad. If you feel like, it's like that, that sick dropping feeling in your stomach, like when you do your very best for your children and somehow, some way you still mess up or you fail them. That's how I felt. I felt like I hadn't been able to adequately protect her um, and I had no, I had no recourse. So that's my story about Karen. I loved her. I learned a lot from her. I learned a lot about myself. She changed the trajectory of my life, knowing her and climbing into her skin. Um, but the movie was such a disappointment and the lights went up and I couldn't look at anyone and people were saying, oh, congratulations, whatever. But I was so ashamed because, because the movie you guys saw wasn't the movie that we shot. So that's Karen. Let's see, um, I finally answered, <laughs> but I did. I loved her so much. I just loved her so much. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Okay. Oh, uh, Les Lamont author. Great true life ghostly tale. That's from yesterday, last Tuesday's one where I told about masquerade and the what happened there. Um, and totally switching <laughs> and totally switching what? Oh, sure. Topics. <laughs> My writing is so bad. And totally switching topics. That cardigan is so stylish. Well, I should think so because Jen gave it to me. <laughs> Whenever you see a stylish piece of clothing, you can know that I got it from either Jen or Becky because <laughs> I didn't buy it. Every once in a while, I bought it. If I if I bought it, then I'll, I'll let you know too. But thank you. I thought it, I think it is too. I've got two of those. One that one was brown, and then I have one that's black that has, and then Jen also gave me the top by the same designer that had a flower pattern that I've worn once when I've talked to you. Um, let's see, so I did those. Oh, one asset, I just wanted to share this with you because we have tea timers from all walks of life. So one asset said, came home from feeding baby possums, 
<laughs> like, are you kidding me? I can't even imagine what a baby possum would be like. Um, and uh, cleaning enclo enclosures at a wildlife reserve, sat down to a homemade eggnog latte and checked out tea time. Ah, so nice and relaxing. I'm in pain all over from bend, all the bending over I have to do. I feel your, I feel you. I used to have to, when I was little, I was in charge of cleaning out the chicken house. Oh my gosh. Like if anybody ever asks you to clean out, a volunteer to clean out a chicken house, do anything else. Like cow poop, scoop that up. That's no problem. It smells, it smells okay. You know, it just smells like hay and kind of whatever. But chicken poop, it's the worst Worse smell, way worse than baby diapers when they start eating solid food. It's like the worst thing ever. And you're trapped in there and your eyes are like this. I used to wear a turtleneck when I had to clean it so I could put it up over my face. But uh, yeah, so I, I hope baby possum poo isn't quite as smelly as chicken poo. Although, you know, we probably had, we had 120 chickens. So there was a lot of chicken poo. Uh, I had a favorite chicken named Coconut Zigzag that I wrote about, I told you in, um, in uh, what was that called porcupine and I also wrote about when I pet the wild porcupine um, which is a really fun story as well oh wildlife um, wildlife rescue I dropped something off at a wildlife rescue with my kids here's what happened I was um, driving from Canada which I often did to LA because I had uh, work to do and Will was with his daddy and I had Emily and David they were quite young and I had our big Rottweiler dog uh, who liked to stick her head out the window and have her have this part of mouth go <laughs> like this. Like she liked to have it flutter in the wind. She was so, nothing made her happier than a road trip. So we were driving along Highway 5 and all of a sudden I, uh, I see this thing by the side of the road and whenever that happens, you always feel a little bit bad for whatever creature got killed. But then as a truck went by, the wind that came off of it blew it and it went like this and it's it's it hopped a little and had uh, its wing fly up and I'm like oh no it's alive and I didn't know how badly it was hurt or if it would survive but I thought it must be terrible being on the side of the road not knowing when something's gonna swerve and just be the end of you and I'll just I'll just go and pick it up and move it to the sides in because there was wooded area over here so it could you know pass away in peace if it was really badly hurt. So I stopped my car, put on my blinkers and I stopped my car and I waited for the trucks to go by. Cause luckily it was winter, well no winter going into spring. So there wasn't that much traffic. It was kind of wet um, and whoosh, another truck went by and whoosh, another truck. And then I dodged across and I went to scoop up the, I thought real peaceful thoughts when I got there. So it wouldn't be scared. I'm like, it's okay, it's okay. And I picked it up and it went quack, 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 quack. And out from under it went a whole bunch of baby ducklings, like beep, 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 all over the place. And I'm like, oh no. And luckily there was a lull in the traffic. So she was quack, quacking. And I put her in my, I, I held her like this and I, I grabbed my skirt because I was wearing a dress and I held it in my teeth because I had to have my arms free. And I went holding the duck, plucking up baby, baby ducklings and plopping them in my in my um, skirt with the thing like this and quickly grabbing them. Some got across the road and I grabbed them and grabbed them. And unfortunately two went through a barbed wire, a uh, really high barbed wire fence and I couldn't get them and I fe felt so bad, but there was nothing I could do because I couldn't climb over them. And my kids were in the car and I couldn't leave them on the side of the road either to try to chase down these through the, climbing over barbed wire fence with the with a bunch of ducklings in my, and so I had to leave them, which I felt really, really bad for, but I couldn't get them. It was way high. And um, so I took them back to the car and the kids are like, what's going on? And I said, oh, we found this duckling and she, duck and she's okay and there's baby ducklings. So my daughter, she had her favorite blanket that was had a soft fringe to it that she always would um, go like this with when she slept. And so she said, they can use my, my um, my blanket for a bed so we made a little kind of a thing on the duck on the floor and uh on the front front because we didn't want to put them in the back because we had a big rottweiler and that might scare them and uh, so we made a little nest and and i we shut the door and then i put the duckling and the big the duck and the baby ducklings there and then i started to drive edge onto the traffic but then the um the mother duck went quack 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 and the baby duck went beep, beep, beep. 
And then they all started running around the car. And it's like, oh no, what do we do? Because I didn't want them to get under the gas pedal. So I had to rear to go to the side of the thing. And then we had to put them on the floor by, um, by Emily. And she had to go down like this to kind of protect them. Um, she had her legs down like this and, and had her hands down like this so that they wouldn't run all around the car. And, and, we, um, and we made the nest there. And so then we got off we drove and then we got off and I didn't know what to do. We found a feed shop and we got duck food and water. And then I had to find a motel that would let me stay with not only two kids and a Rottweiler, but a duck and a bunch of ducklings. <laughs> so I had to pay like a whole bunch of down deposit. And I said, don't worry, I'll keep them in the, in the bathtub and I'll clean out the bathtub. So I had to do a, a damage deposit in case we damaged the room, but we didn't. And then that, that morning we found, because we went to the vet and the vet said there was a wildlife reserve, a rescue place up further. Um, so, so, but they were closed now. So we went the next morning, we stayed over and we went the next morning and we took the duck, but one of the ducklings had gotten its neck broken because the mother duck had accidentally stepped on it because she couldn't balance her well because she had a broken wing and leg. And um, so we buried it outside in the field behind the motel and the kids cried and I was sad too and then um we we put a little duck feed in the in the <laughs> in the little grave too and said a prayer and then we took the duckling and the duck the ducklings the remaining ducklings and the duck to the wildlife rescue and they wrote to us and they said that um that they were doing well and that they joined other that the they fixed, I paid, left money for the vet bill and they had fixed the mother one, but that another doc had adopted the baby so that they were all doing really well. So we were really happy about that because I thought I was going to have to take them to my little apartment and keep the ducks in my apartment. And I knew you weren't allowed to keep ducks in your apartment <laughs> while I shot the, the thing I was doing. So I was really happy. So thank you, uh, One Asset, for your work with the wildlife um, rescue place. That's really wonderful. And it helps people like me not have heart attacks and have to have ducklings in their apartment. <laughs> so be safe, everybody, especially I know Halloween's a time to get together, but, but just uh, maybe get together remotely like this. And um, I was thinking of um, trying to get an outfit together, but, but I didn't because I don't have one. <laughs> oh, wait. Okay. Here. Wait. I can do this. Wait. Okay. Ooh, happy Halloween, everybody. <laughs> Ooh, I wonder what I am. It's me. Don't worry. Bye-bye. <laughs>